It's March 10th, 1831, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The French Foreign Legion has long had a reputation for attracting cutthroats, political refugees and outlaws, all of whom assume a nom de guerre when they join up, then mercilessly do France's bidding in exchange for both money and eventual redemption in the form of French citizenship. And not all of this is a myth, of course, but it wasn't the express intention of King Louis-Philippe when he ordered the establishment of the Legion today in history back in 1831 to sort of kill two birds with one stone, first sweeping up foreigners and undesirable who were hanging around France, and second, sending them off to help him conquer Algeria. Yeah, I mean, it's a policy that I think Suella Braverman would still like. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I've got a great use for all these refugees that we've been receiving. Cannon Let's fodder. Send them off to die yeah. in other countries. <laughs> right. Want to be French so much? Prove it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and mercenaries have played a huge role in conflicts throughout history. It's sort of fallen out of fashion now. I think there's an idea that if you want to serve in the army, you should be doing it out of patriotic reasons and not because you're being paid gold ingots. But the French Foreign Legion, although technically is a part of the French army, they're not mercenaries, they are a remnant of this now kind of obsolete facet of warfare. In fact, Geneva Convention protections explicitly don't apply to mercenaries, which might explain why they're so ruthless. Mm -hmm. And France especially had come to rely on foreign troops. This was really an evolution from the Napoleonic era. Yeah, just to position us in where this uh, moment in history is taking place. So the French Revolution of 1830 has just taken place the year before. uh, And not the revolution. No, this was the second revolution to, you know, the first. It was like, we don't like this king, we'll have a different king. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and the thing that Louis Philippe didn't want to do at this early stage in his reign was piss off the army too much. And the previous year, France had invaded Algeria, and now they needed additional manpower to occupy the territory. And it was a really undesirable posting for regular troops. You know, they didn't want to go hundreds of miles away from home and just sit around in the desert occupying a foreign country. So this was a really good use of this new legion, is that they can go wherever. They don't, you know, as far as the French state is concerned, they don't have a homeland. And at no political cost domestically as well. You know, if these guys died, people in France would say, well, they fought for our country so valiantly despite the fact they weren't born here. What an incredible thing. Viva la France. <laughs> Look at our values. Uh, whereas, you know, French citizens had died out there for a cause that a lot of people in France weren't that bothered by and, and could see the other side of. Why are we invading Algeria? Um, that would have been um, politically problematic. And it's interesting, isn't it, that given that that's the legacy, colonialism, basically, it's still... Algeria that is um, associated with the French Foreign Legion all these years later in their uniform, the famous white hats they wear, the kepi, are the colour they are because that's the colour of camel bones in the desert. Wow. So there's this like heroic association with what happened in Algeria, which in itself you'd think these days would be more problematic. Well, the other handy thing was that it cleared France out of these leftover foreigners who had come from the regiments that were formed in those campaigns of Napoleon. Germans and Swedes and Poles and Hungarians who really, for Louis Philippe, needed some sort of a home and it was quite convenient to be able to uh, to pop them in uniform and then send them off to Algeria. Although when they got there, it really wasn't warfare that they started doing first of all. They started off by building forts and roads and kind of uh, clearing swamps and so on. Yeah, the reason they have this reputation for extreme endurance is because they were assigned work like this. You know, they became famous for their lengthy marches, particularly during extreme heat and being able to build defences quickly. And th- this was all coming from the fact that they were being given the jobs that French soldiers didn't want to do mm. and that French people didn't want to see their soldiers doing. So they've always had this kind of paradoxical status on one hand being glorified and idolised as being, you know, these romantic, brave, ruthless, determined troops who can do anything, but also being viewed with suspicion, you know, the best kept at arm's length, being given the worst jobs, and the most remote postings. And not all always for a lot of money either. It was five centimes a day. Mm. A legionnaire in 1831 could afford wine or tobacco, but not both. Hard choice. (laughs) (laughs) So why were they doing it? Why would you fight hard for France in far-flung places? And 
essentially, it was because it was a break from your past, yeah. wasn't it? They, they didn't ask too many questions about where you came from. Yeah, although that came to be a problem in the early days because they initially organised their battalions by language groups. And each of those language groups kind of, I suppose, still had some sense of identification with themselves right. as that particular ethnicity or linguistic grouping or whatever. But as time went on, they learnt the lesson of this because there was great desertion in the early days and they started to reimagine how the French Foreign Legion should be composed and it was by mixing up all of the languages into just one sort of amorphous blob. Yeah, the original six battalions formed on this day by Louis-Philippe were Swiss, Poles, Germans, Italians, Spanish and Dutch-speaking Belgians. And that grouping came to an end in 1835 when, for political reasons that are a bit lengthy to get into, the Legion ended up being transferred to the Spanish government. The Spanish government didn't really care about them and over time it kind of dwindled almost to nothing. There were only 500 men left at the end. You know, they were scavenging for food. The Spanish government didn't want anything to do with them. And it was during this time period that the commander dissolved these national battalions precisely to try and boost flagging morale of being part of this essentially, you know, amputated part of the French army. And, and that incarnation of the Legion eventually was kind of dissolved. They started a new foreign legion in France, but they kept this principle that they would no longer segregate the troops by their nationality. Yeah, and they started the new legion because Louis-Philippe was like, do you know what? I actually did need those troops back in Algeria. We are still oh, what fighting those a war. guys. I like yeah. them. <laughs> did I just send those guys to Spain? What a mistake. <laughs> um, so along comes the new legion. And under the leadership of Thomas Robert Bugode, they really changed their strategy altogether, where previously they'd been digging into these Go fortified... around handing out flowers, <laughs> right. no marching. Well, not so much that. <laughs> um, but they'd been digging into particular locations and setting up forts and then finding themselves being attacked. And instead, what uh, Bergaud did was he organised them into mobile columns and they now took the war to the Algerians in these really crushing, brutal marches where, uh, according to one Belgian memoirist, you had to have the thighs of a buck, the heart of a lion and the stomach of an ant. <laughs> so it also was part of this myth-making that was going on, that these were the guys who could go around and cause havoc uh, and win wars in spite of great difficulty or actually almost attracted by the great difficulty nihilism mm. is one of the brand values right. isn't it of the french foreign legion yeah. they have a significantly higher than average rate of suicide in the legion compared to other armed forces and some of the quote-unquote games that they're known for um, during the two world wars russian soldiers um, sparked a tradition for legionnaires playing cuckoo uh, cuckoo is when two men in the army this is just for fun on your downtime mm -hmm. Uh, enter a darkened room, one calls Cuckoo, then dives for cover, the other shoots a loaded revolver, then he calls Cuckoo and the other one fires until like... someone dies or both revolvers are empty. This is like the highest stakes version of Marco Polo <laughs> the pool game ever. Uh, there was another one called Buffalo, which is where you and your opponent, again, both of you serving in the same army, uh, down a bottle of vermouth and then charge at each other head first with your hands tied behind your back. And then if both men are still standing, you drink another bottle until someone is concussed. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, and you can see that attitude in the fact that the biggest day in the French Foreign Legion calendar is not this day in history. It's not its founding. It's Cameron Day, which commemorates mm. a battle in Mexico in 1863 in which a handful of legionnaires stood against 2,000 Mexican troops and every single one of them was killed, wounded or captured. So this was not a victory for the Legion. And in fact, the highest honour that you can have in the Legion is being chosen to carry the wooden hand of their commander, Captain Jean d'Anjou. He actually lost his hand before the battle in Mexico during this annual commemoration ceremony that takes place at the Legion's HQ in Aubagne in the south of France. They are still an elite fighting organisation today. Yeah, the only way to join still, even in the age of the internet, is to physically present yourself at a recruitment office. They're all in mainland France. The website says you can join 24-7, but a quick look on Google Maps suggests this actually means ideally eight to five on weekdays. Yeah. <laughs> and also you have to be single i mean you can be married but then when you're in the legion you're single your paperwork says you're single wow. you know there are no dependents involved 
Sorry, love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be male, aged between 17 and a half and 39 and a half years. Oh, we're just too old, Arian. What a, <laughs> what shame. a shame. Just missing out. That well, well so close you may it. still not qualify. It depends if you meet the other f- requirements. You have to have a BMI between 18 and 30. I think you guys sure. would be fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to be literate in your native tongue. No French is required. Still good. And you must have no more than six missing teeth. (laughs) You also can't be a serious criminal these days. Mm. (laughs) They're not interested in rapists, murderers or serious drug dealers. So that rules you out, Rebecca. (laughs) (laughs) And so another week of retrospecting ends. But next week begins a day early at Club Retrospectors. Join us now to get an exclusive episode every Sunday. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.